Hey guys, welcome back to my page. So I finally got around to doing this topic. And I know it's going to be probably difficult for some of you guys to talk about or even to listen to. So that's why I give you guys this warning that this is this video is for mature audiences only. Mature audiences. So if you're mature enough to talk about it, then you're welcome to join the discussion and to comment here below or just to listen. But this is um, an issue that I know affects a lot of men, more men than what people probably would even imagine. This is also a topic that is kind of different from the topics that I'm used to talking about, because as you guys may know, my research interests are in um, studying implicit racial bias um, in children and... Um, studying black identity development that's pretty much those are my main research focus um, points but this topic is slightly different than what i'm used to talking about but i'm very knowledgeable about this topic um obviously you know i have exposure to it um just with what i study you know being that you guys know that i'm in my second year of a phd program in clinical psychology psychology has always been with me you know i got a bachelor's degree in psychology and master's in counseling um so i'm pretty much immersed into this topic and then pretty much any almost a lot of topics in psychology so you guys can pretty much expect <laughs> a lot coming from my way as it relates to various topics in psychology. But erectile dysfunction is a disorder that has made its way into the DSM. And the DSM, for you guys who are not aware, stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So it's simply the Bible for psychologists, for clinicians, for therapists, it's what we use to diagnose clients. I know some of you guys probably watching and probably aren't really too fond of mental health diagnoses, but I feel that this one is worth talking about. This one is worth bringing to the forefront because I think it is a taboo topic. You know, the whole idea behind, you know, the the one minute man, the two minute man. I think Missy Elliott back in the day made a song about how she don't want no one minute man or two minute man. And people make a joke about it, they clown about it, you know. But it's a, it's a real issue, you know, it's a real issue. And I think historically people have thought it to be an issue that only impacts older men. So men like in their 50s or maybe even 40s, 50s, 60s you know, and upward, but no, this is an issue that impacts even young men as early as in their 20s and even in their 30s. Um, depending on the cause of it, you know, it can have some serious implications. It can have, you know, it can cause a lot of impairment and distress in an individual who is having to face this issue of erectile dysfunction. So I'm going to read to you guys what the DSM manual says. This is the technical definition of erectile dysfunction. And then I'll just sum it up and put it in my words for you guys. And if you guys are watching, you know, I hate when I get stuff on my freaking manual in my book. It's like something spilled in my book bag and yuck. Okay. But as you guys are watching, feel free to comment below and let me know where you guys are tuning in from. Okay. So it is classified as a sexual dysfunction. And it's treatable, by the way. So there's some hope. So continue to watch you guys until the end. And we'll talk about some treatment recommendations. But this is the DSM uh, technical diagnostic criteria. So at least one of the three following symptoms must be experienced on almost all or all occasions of sexual activity. So that's between 75% to 100% of sexual activity that this, um, these symptoms are experienced. All right, hi, Charisma from Richmond, Virginia. 
All right, so feel free to share this video also with um, your followers because you may have some male friends, some male fans that this issue may be may apply to. So I think you know if it can help, it can help someone. Then why not share it? So these are the symptom criteria. Number one, mark difficulty in obtaining an erection during sexual activity. Number two, mark difficulty in maintaining an erection until the completion of sexual activity. And then number three, mark decrease in erectile rigidity. So as it says, basically, to meet the criteria, you either have to fall in one of those three categories where you have difficulty getting an erection, which is, they say, they call it obtaining an erection, but simply getting an erection, you have difficulty getting an erection, you have difficulty maintaining an erection or keeping an erection and then or you have marked decrease in erectile rigidity so how rigid is your penis now for a healthy male especially a young healthy male a full erection usually can get is usually 90 degrees right it's perpendicular but for a man who has issues with erectile um, dysfunction, who has issues with maintaining an erection or the rigidity of his erection, the angle, the degree angle isn't that high, right? You know, so when you're looking at the penis as um, in relation to his body, essentially, the angle is more downward. The, the penis is more angled downward when he comes to an erection. Whereas a younger, healthier, and a younger, healthier male, the angle is 90 degrees. So it's like perpendicular, right, to his body and the ground. Now, aside from that, the symptoms have to persist for at least approximately six months. So this is not something that just happens, let's say, one night, you know, or one weekend or something like that, or if a person is having one bad day, but they persist for a minimum duration of approximately six months, right? The symptoms in criterion A, which um, are the criteria, the symptoms that I read to you guys initially, those one of three symptoms, they must cause significant distress in individuals. So... When the DSM refers to significant distress, that simply means that it impacts one of the major areas of their daily function, whether that is in, at home, in personal relationships, or at school, or at work, just some area of their daily function. In this case, I mean, the obvious would be, you know, in the home, in their relationship, in their intimate relationship. So that's one key indicator that there is something wrong and that a person, a guy could meet the criteria for erectile dysfunction is if, you know, let's say his wife, you know, is complaining about um, not being satisfied sexually, you know, in the bedroom, that's causing an impairment in one of the major areas of his life It's causing significant distress. And it's usually not just, you know, the partner who is experiencing the stress, but is the person themselves is experiencing the stress from this issue. And also the other criteria, and this is a really important one, is that the sexual dysfunction is not better explained by a non-sexual mental disorder or as a consequence of a severe relationship distress or other significant distressors and is not attributable to the effects of a substance medication or another medical condition. Now, the thing about that, though, because what it's simply saying is that it's not due to some other outside cause, right? But we know that erectile dysfunction can come as a result and usually comes as a result of substance use or abuse. And that would be include alcohol. Alcohol is usually one of the main substances that have a negative impact on a male's ability to um, to get an erection, but more specifically maintain an erection. Not only that, there are me some medical conditions that um, 
usually have an impact on a male's ability to to be um, erect, to get an erection, unfortunately. Um, those medical conditions are diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, anything dealing with blood flow, anything that constricts, you know, or impacts a person's blood, restricts a, a person's blood flow can have a negative impact on a man's um, arousal, right? His whole, this whole sexual response cycle can be impacted um, if he's having these medical issues, especially with heart disease. Because what happens is that the arteries are broken down. The arteries are no longer functioning as they should, so the blood is not going where it should go for the male, unfortunately. Now, I don't know if you guys have experienced this. If you guys are watching, any males are watching, I'm pretty sure, like, okay. <laughs> I talked to a friend before I did this video, a guy friend, and he was just like, nobody is not going to open up and share, you know, their personal experience about this, especially men anyway, because, you know, the whole idea of being able to maintain an erection, right? Like that ties into a person's manhood. That's part of a, a man's identity in, 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 in a sense, right? To be able to please a woman sexually, you know, is part of a, a, per, a man's manhood, his identity. So if a man is having issues with, um, in the bedroom, let's say, right? He's having issues with the way his body is working in the bedroom, his tool, right? His, his main tool down there, right? That's, that's so important that it works properly. He, if he's having issues with that, um, then that can definitely have, you know, psychological consequences. And then that's, that's the whole reason why I wanted to do this video because you know, I feel like it's a, with an issue being so taboo where, you know, a lot of men don't want to talk about, about it. A lot of men, being that it's not a subject that's talked about often, a lot of times people can experience something and not know that they are being impacted by it. So you can have many men, you know, probably watching this video, or even that you know, you know, in, in your close circle, that may be struggling with this very issue, but just either don't know what's going on or don't want to talk about it, feel ashamed about it. You know, you have to realize that there are certain, you know, things that come along with this type of disorder. Being able to get an erection and maintain an erection is very essential, especially in a relationship, you know, a sexual relationship with a woman. And if a man is having issues with that, it can cause issues essentially in the relationship. A lot of couples who end up in, in couples counseling, um, oftentimes sexual um, dysfunctions are the root, one of the root causes of the reason why they're there. Not, not just a root cause, but a key indicator that there's something wrong in the couple's relationship. So where you see sexual dysfunction in couples, a lot of times you see a lot of, you know, couple distress, right? There are arguments, there are fights. And it just kind of it's bi-directional, right? It goes it goes both ways. When you have fights, a lot of times there's issue with, you know, the sexual function and where the sex is not good. But I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you guys who are watching can attest that, you know, I guess the crazier the fights are, right, in the relationship, the more chaotic the, the relationship is, the better the sex. But that's not always the case. And, you know, I mentioned the whole idea about age because we know that this dysfunction, this disorder is very common in older men, men that you know, are 50 and over. The average age is 50 and over. But it's not to say that men in their 30s and even men in their 20s experience this very unfortunate issue. I want to talk about it um, 
in terms of different behaviors, lifestyle choices that people make that can impact, you know, their ability to maintain an erection or it can impact their likelihood that they will experience a sexual dysfunction. Because health, right, our health is so important, right? What we eat, what we consume, what we put into our bodies, you know, our lifestyle choices, how much sleep we get, that all has an impact on our sexual function, believe it or not. A lot of times you hear them saying that, you know, you know, a dick, essentially has a mind of its own. And that's why this video is for people 18 and over because I may use some language and it's I'm only using it because it's common language that's used in our culture. So it's what the kind of language that we understand. So hopefully nobody's going to be offended by what I'm saying. But you guys have heard the saying, right? That a dick has a mind of its own, right? Penis penises have a mind of their own essentially, right? But the truth of the matter is that a penis not necessarily has a mind of its own. You know, your penis, a man's penis is connected to his mind, you know. And so psychologically, people, I think, aren't always aware of the, the psychological connection that is, that happens between a person's mind and their penis. If a person is under a lot of stress, right, a lot of pressure, and there's a lot going on in that person's life, it's not to say that a man can't get an erection if he's stressed out. But as when we, we look at age, right, because age is a, a significant factor in this, age and stress you know those two factors hand in hand it's like you're working against something you're working against nature naturally you know we know that men it's only natural for a man to get an erection right it just happens you know a lot of times men wake up with erections that's just natural right that's a lot of times one key indicator if a man has um, an issue with um, sexual dysfunction because in the morning, if there's no erection, then that could be an indicator. It's not a definite giveaway, but that's definitely, I think, you know, it's, it's, it can be one key indicator. There's a test that um, is done oftentimes in, in therapy where they will wrap um, a piece of tape, not necessarily a tape, but it's kind of like tape. They wrap it around the penis and you can kind of gauge if an erection happened you know in the in the um they call it the waking hours so the hours the time the period in which a person is in between sleep and wake right the waking hours in that hour when a man is about to wake up he usually gets an erection and that's why i know women joke about it a lot of times too right how men just all of a sudden wake up with <laughs> with a hard dick, right? They wake up with a, um, an erection. But that happens in a lot of men. And that's that's pretty normal. That's, that's natural for a man to do that. And so that's, you know, that's definitely one, one key indicator. But back to this whole idea of stress and the mind and the role that a person's psychology plays on their ability to maintain an erection, a lot of times, and that's, I think that's a good thing, right? Because if we know that if the cause of a man's, you know, erectile dysfunction is due to stress, then how easily treatable is that compared to if it's due to a more significant issue, medical issue, like hypertension, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, or something like that. Something that requires a little bit more attention. And a lot of times, unfortunately, when a person is diagnosed with those kinds of diseases, um, you know, sometimes the medication that's prescribed for those disorders, those medical conditions, <laughs> don't make the situation any better. It essentially makes it worse than what it was from the beginning. So that's the downside to it. 
But that's the reason why I kind of want to speak to you guys from the angle of just a mild condition of um, erectile dysfunction, something that is more manageable, something that is usually just due to too much stress. A lot of men, unfortunately, experience this, and it happens way before a man, way before a man reaches his fifties, right? It happens, you know, in the thirties and even in the forties. You know, surprisingly, it happens in, in a in man's thirties, and I've seen cases, heard cases where it's happened even in a man's, you know, when he's twenty in his twenties, not twenty years old, but you know, in his twenties, closer towards his thirties. So, like I said, I know this topic isn't going to be something that a lot of people are going <laughs> to want to, I guess, contribute to or talk about, especially men, because it's kind of shameful to know that, you know, you have this this issue where you can't get up. A lot of men are like, you know, oh, you know, they brag about their ability to get an erection. They brag about how big the penis is, right? You know, that's just something that men take pride in. So, for a man... If he's having issues with being able to keep an erection, you know, that, that almost takes away his ego. That takes away his ability to brag about, about brag about his manhood, essentially, right? Because for a lot of men, their manhood is tied to their penis, essentially. So a lot of men, you know, don't necessarily feel masculine if they don't have a, 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 a big penis, unfortunately, you know? And for men who have a, a huge penis, right? You know, it's like they equate that with being more masculine, being more dominant. And so no matter the size of the penis, if a man is struggling with, you know, impotent issues and being able to keep himself, you know, erect during the course of a sexual activity, just imagine the impact it can have on his self-esteem. Not only on his self-esteem, but his relationship to his partner, you know, and just everything else. It's like, if a man isn't happy in that aspect of his life, then how can he be happy in the, the rest of his life, right? He's going to probably have some difficulties, especially if, you know, sexual activity, right? Sexual satisfaction is important to him. Who doesn't like sex? Who doesn't like sex, right? I mean, majority of us, as as long as we are in the reproductive phase of life, you can reproduce. You know, that's kind of like part of part of your identity as a person. That's part of you know your your humanity. And so, for that to be taken away from you, just imagine the psychological impact it can have on a person when they can no longer just do what they're naturally designed to do. That's like a woman not being able to have kids, you know? It's like you're, you're born with the womb, you're born with this reproductive system, but unfortunately it doesn't work right. And so, you know, you feel like you're not woman enough, right? Because you don't have the ability to, pro to produce kids, essentially. The same thing with men who struggle with this issue. Something as simple as... Um, Talk therapy can can help, can change the situation around. Because again, like I said, you know, if it's due to stress where a man is just, sometimes, you know, men, they work a lot, right? Men are challenged, are forced to be breadwinners, right? To bring home the bacon. So for a man that works so much, who's so dedicated to his career, you know, a lot of times it can have a negative impact. And it becomes like a, a domino effect, right? Where he's stressed out. The stress causes him to self-medicate for, I mean, it's not uncommon in our culture for men to go home after work and get a case of beer or get a, a bottle of alcohol and then becomes this continuous cycle. And I think, you know, for some people, a lot of people assume that drinking alcohol actually helps with an erection or helps, you know, improve sexual functioning. But I think that is a myth. That's a huge myth. Not always. I think initially, I think, I mean, to a certain extent, because it, it happens on a curve. So 
initially if a person you know has has alcohol has drank alcohol yes it does get the blood flowing right it does increase blood circulation that's why you feel a little bit warmer when you drink right because it increases your blood flow it increases your heart rate but there comes a point in time where too much consumption of alcohol can actually have the reverse effect where you're drinking so much alcohol that your body is just not going to respond the same. It's not going to function as it would normally if you were sober. So that's, that's the real reason why I went to this video because I know that there are a lot of men out there who face this issue of erectile dysfunction and they're not able to keep an erection they're not able to keep their partner satisfied yet you know they do struggle they do struggle with an addiction and, and granted now addiction substance abuse and addiction is a is a serious issue it's not something that you can just okay I'm just gonna quit cold turkey you know especially if you are chemically dependent upon it so I do recommend that if you know there's anyone watching this video who has developed a chemical dependency to drugs or alcohol that you do seek out you know professional help from a licensed clinician because it's something that a lot of people struggle with being able to just do alone being able to just just quit cold turkey but for the sake of your health you know especially you know for men who for sex for them is important for the sake of just being able to get an erection you know it's something i think that is worth taking a look into and to get you know some additional help with um if you guys you know have want to chime in feel free to chime in on this topic you know like i said i understand that it's a very sensitive topic you know it's taboo for a reason because you know i guess even just talking about it makes people feel uncomfortable thinking about it you know it's not like men are just going to go around saying that oh i can't i can't get my dick hard or i have trouble you know getting my dick up and even you know unfortunately i've seen this in some relationships where um one of because you can go both ways right so sexual dysfunction does not only impact uh, men but it also impacts women where women can have issues with arousal too and being able to be um, the part of their reproductive not reproductive but sexual response cycle you know there's a part called arousal for the woman where you know in our culture we call it getting wet right but you know basically she has issues down there with that that area and she's not able to get lubricated like most women are right she has issues with that so it can go both ways for a man and a woman it's not that you know men just have arousal issues women have issues with arousal too but i feel like you know just being able to kind of talk about it we can kind of see that this issue is not something that affects people when they get older. I mean, it affects people when they're younger. And just knowing, I guess, what is the cause of it, especially when you're younger, you can probably nip some things in the bud, right? So if you know that it's some things in your lifestyle that are causing this issue, this is a simple fixing it is as simple as just changing, making some small lifestyle changes. simple as that but as I was saying I've seen like unfortunately in a lot of relationships where you know people not being aware of what's going on in their body and not understanding okay why is not my penis why my penis is not working as it should be right you know it's like here you are in the moment wanting to get aroused right wanting to come to a full erection so you could insert it into your partner and to be able to enjoy each other. But then there's a problem. And men wonder why. And granted, if this issue happens in the context 
of a relationship, you know, where there there's problems going on, right? Where there's conflict, more often than not, this is what you see. Unfortunately, the the partner who's having the issue tends to blame the other partner, right? Point the finger at the other partner and say, it's your fault. It's your fault as to why I can't keep an erection. Assuming that, okay, if they're with another person, they will be able to get an erection. And while that could be true, oftentimes the root cause isn't has nothing to do with how well stimulated they are by their partner as it does about what's going on in their brain, in their mind, psychologically. And a lot of times, like I said, you know, some of the other the issues can be biological, not only psychological, but biological, biological problems. You know, there are some issues with the way your blood and your body is being circulated and your arteries have broken down how is it that you could get an erection, right? So I think it's helpful for you guys to not only listen to and watch this video, but to also go and do more research on this. You know, even seek out a licensed clinician that you could talk to about this. You know, because I think for some men, some men, I guess, fix the problem or attempt to treat themselves by, you know, just getting some trying to get over-the-counter medication or trying to find some natural herbal remedies to fix the problem, but it really doesn't fix the root of the problem, right? It's like they have to take those pills in order to get an erection. Without those pills, it's like they can't get an erection. You know, not an erection, that they, the kind of erection they want to get, the full erection, right? And so I think that, you know, for some men, I guess it, it may work for them, right? Relying on the, those pills. But I don't think, you know, a younger guy, especially, you know, if he's in his 30s or 40s, wants to necessarily have to de be dependent upon a pill. I mean, if you could fix the problem by making a, a lifestyle change, such as cutting back on your drinking or working out more or changing what you eat, then wouldn't that be better than having to rely on a pill every time you get ready to have sex and you're taking this pill every day? You know, it's like, what happens if you don't take the pill? And it's like, okay, well, you're not gonna, uh, the woman is gonna see a huge difference in how rigid your penis is. It's like when you take the pill, your penis is rock hard, it's very rigid, it's very strong, it's erect, but you don't take the pill, then your penis is not as strong, it's not as erect. That can be very, I think, very challenging, I think, in a lot of relationships where it's very frustrating, I think. And so, you know, because especially when you're younger, and not just when you're younger, but I mean, even older men... Sex is important to older men, you know, in their 50s, in their 60s, even in their 70s. My dad is like in his 70s, right? Like 76. <laughs> and my dad still has sex, right? Sex is very important to him, you know? So I think, you know, it's just, it's not really about age, but I think that it's just about humanity. Knowing that and just being honest with yourself and knowing that, you know, if sex is important to you, comment below if sex is important to you. If sex is important to you, whether you're a man or a woman, comment below if you don't mind sharing. I hate it when I get those bumps. I'm like PMSing right now. But, I mean, I, I'm, I like talking about these kinds of topics. And I just kind of wanted to kind of peek in for a quick minute and just share my thoughts and my ideas on this. There's so much that I can say about this topic, but I want it to be more of an interactive discussion. And I know I can understand that this is a topic that is kind of difficult for a lot of men to talk about. But if anything, even if you don't comment below and you, if you don't get involved in the discussion, at least you can watch it and at least you can become more aware that this is a very common issue, whether you hear other men talk about it or not, it's something that is very, very, very common. And not just among 
men in their 40s and 50s. And I guess men in that age can probably say, whew, I thought it was just me. But no, it's actually younger men that we are finding that this issue is impacting. You know, and a lot of times it's due to substance abuse, substance and alcohol abuse, and people not aware, not aware of the fact how alcohol can have such a negative impact on a person's sexual response cycle, a huge, huge impact. Let's check something real quick. But, and it's not something I think that a lot of men, especially African-American men necessarily go to treatment for, right? Like you don't see that many Af black men saying, all right, I'm going to go talk to a therapist about, you know, what's going on. A lot of times they don't really make the connection. It's like, okay. So they know that their penis is not functioning right because it makes no sense, right? That if you, let's say, are with your partner who you love very dearly, and then you're right in the moment and then your penis just is not working. It's like, what is wrong with my penis, right? And I think it does serve an, an adaptive uh, purpose because luckily for men, when they are under a lot of stress, their penis doesn't work, you know, so that they can't get raped, right? No one can force themselves on them to have sex on a man when they are so overwhelmed because the penis is just not going to get up anyway. So I think that is a very good protective factor for men. Do they need it? I don't know. Because most, a lot of men, you know, are kind of strong, you know, no matter really how masculine you are, you know, it's just by default, you know, men typically are stronger than women. So if a man, you know, was in a situation where he was getting raped, he could fight her off, right? But luckily, you know, his body responds in a way that he shuts down the sexual response cycle, you know, shuts down for a man when they're when he's under a lot of stress. If you men, if you can attest to this and if you don't mind being open and transparent, you know, I'm wondering for men, when you are under a lot of stress, you know, do you get turned on easily? Because I can imagine that, you know, if you, let's say if you're wondering stress in terms of primitive stress, right? Like you're worried about your survival. You're worried about how you're going to pay your bills and where you're going to sleep at and things like that, or losing your job or something like that, right? If you're stressed out because of those reasons, how likely is it that you're going to be thinking about sex anyway? I don't know. For a lot of men, I guess, some might say, I can say a lot of men, right? But you do have a good number of men that, for them, sex is like therapy. So if they're stressed, you know, then they turn to sex and it's like sex is like the cure-all, right? It makes them feel better. It gives them a way, an outlet to release all of that tension, all of that stress. But I think that there is a certain degree of stress, right? Because this just happens on a spectrum. So it's not to say that, okay, if you're stressed, then your your tool isn't going to work down there. It's not to say that, but it is to say that a certain degree of stress, if you have a certain degree of stress, there's a chance that your penis just ain't going to be working the way you want it to work. You know, a certain degree of stress, it's just not going to get up. And even if you do, let's say, get aroused, uh, there's another issue with being able to maintain that erection, to stay aroused to the point of ejaculation. And I, I know how difficult and stressful it can be. I only can just imagine for a man that, you know, does get aroused, but he's not able to maintain an erection through completion, you know? essentially to the point of ejaculation when he wants to ejaculate because it's all about the expected time that a man wants you know to last if a man ejaculates before he expects to then that is an issue too that's a, an issue of sexual dysfunction 
So luckily, this issue, I feel like, I think it's a good thing that it's a common issue in a way so that men who experience this don't feel isolated and don't feel so ashamed to the point that they can't go and seek professional help from a licensed clinician because, I mean, there's a lot of help out there and a lot of times you don't necessarily have to rely on medication, you know, to fix the problem. Like I said, there's talk therapy. Sometimes it's just as simple as trying to get into the root of what's causing the psychological distress. Because like I said earlier, it, the mind is very much connected to our physiology, to our, our body chemistry. All of that is connected. It's all one. Sometimes we try to separate the mind from the body, but it's interconnected. And so just imagine the changes, the positive changes that you can experience as a man if you know you are in a more relaxed state. And not to say that you're 100% stress-free, but your mind and your body are more relaxed to the point where you can actually, your body can function as it should. As it should. I think another issue, you know, as it relates to um, stress is the pressure for a lot of men to perform. You know, we live in a crazy culture where it's like, it's, the, with our the media and the music, they put out these messages like you know it's kind of like a man's job to to lay it down, to break her back, you know, to put it down on her. Like all these phrases that we hear, you guys can come up with some more phrases, but you know you you hear the phrases that put all these pressure, all this pressure on a man to perform in the bedroom, and so. That's why I think it's important to talk about this issue in the context of mental illness. And that's the reason why it's in the DSM, this book right here that I read to you guys from. Because um, when we see issues of sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, it kind of goes hand in hand with mental illness, unfortunately. So if a person is experiencing depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, you know, those issues, those um, psychological dysfunctions can definitely have an uh, impact on a person's ability to to be able to um, maintain an erection or get an erection, unfortunately, because it's just, it's a lot. We don't understand, like, what ha what's happening in a person's mind when a person is de depressed. You know, or when they have anxiety. Let's look at anxiety, for example. When a, a man is under pressure to perform, there's some anxiety there that he's experiencing. Anxiety is a physiological response. And it can be from internal stimuli, such as something that he's thinking, or external stimuli that causes this physiological response where we see an increase in heart rate. Increase in perspiration. You know, you, you see sweat. You see worry. You see this, this, this fear that okay, maybe I'm not doing things the right way. Right? It's like you get worked up, almost to the point of panic. Like you're worried so much that how are you performing? How are you pleasing this woman? You're so concerned. You're you're so preoccupied with this thought and this idea to the point where your your body can't just do what it's going to do naturally, right? Because it's like the idea of an erection, not to say you can't control an erection, right? You can't put yourself in a state of mind to achieve an erection. It's very possible that you can do that. But the process is more of a natural process. You know, it's something that happens when your body is more in a relaxed state. Your mind is relaxed. Your body is relaxed. If you get so worked up and you're 
so preoccupied with the idea of of pleasing a woman and you're so focused on the end goal that you can't even take the time and the and just smell the roses and take the moment to really enjoy the experience of the arousal just enjoy the experience of being in each other's being in a woman's company right because you're so preoccupied with this thing then you can see how it can become a mental block you see how it can get in the way of your body being able to do what it's naturally designed to do and unfortunately there are some issues where men have been abused sexually when they were younger i know that that's not something that a lot of people who like to talk about you know especially even women you know like to talk about their history of abuse but for men there's a lot of sexual abuse in men's history some men's history and that can definitely have an impact although it's something that have, could have happened years years ago and when they were a child it can get in the way of a man being able to feel confident in himself because confidence goes hand in hand to it's, it ties into a man's psychology right to his mental well-being if a man feels insecure if a man feels less confident in himself how likely is it that he will be able to to get an erection and to maintain an erection that reminds me of that movie What's the name of that movie, you guys? It just slipped my mind just that fast. With Antoine Fisher. You guys remember that movie? You know, I know it's a movie, but this is real life. That, you know, how he experiences abuse as a child when he was growing up. You know, he was sexually abused because he grew up in a foster home with people that really didn't have his best interests at heart. And it happened so often. And so when he got to the point where he was an adult and he was around a very beautiful woman, you know, he you can tell that he had this level of insecurity in himself where he did not feel comfortable around her as a man. And I think, you know, yes, to a certain extent, you know, there is it's pretty normative that a man, you know, when he meets a woman, especially if he likes her a lot, there's gonna be some anxiety, right? Certain degree of anxiety. But if you guys go and watch the movie Antoine Fisher, or if you've heard of it, you know, the level of anxiety that he had, you know, it, it's much more significant. And you can tell that there's something else going on. You know, there's something else going on in this man's psyche that is getting in the way. And so you can definitely see how, you know, even, you know, in that character, how he could have some issues with being able to perform in, in the bedroom because... There's this mental block in his mind. There's something going on. That something that's going on can be worked out in the context of therapy. I know a lot of men just like, what? I'm not about to go no dang on therapy. Because we know that majority of clinicians nowadays, especially you know psychologists, are women. So it started off where men kind of dominated this field, but now we see a lot more female therapists, female psychologists. And just the idea of a man going to see a woman, to talk to a woman about his sexual problems, I think can be pretty intimidating, can be pretty frightening for some men. It's like, oh no, I am not going to see no woman to talk to her about my problems. Um, or anybody for that matter, you know? But I'm wondering, like, you know, if you have an issue, it's like, who do you go talk to? How can men feel more comfortable being able to go in and talk to someone about this issue? Because I know it's so stressful for some men to just come to terms with an issue that they have. I would recommend first lifestyle changes. So, I mean, if you're hesitant about going to see a doctor or going to see a, a therapist, you know, they have sex therapists. And no, the sex therapist is not going to have sex with you. But 
because that's definitely will make them lose their license. But, you know, a sex therapist will kind of work with you through these kinds of issues related to sexual dysfunction, you know, and even in the context of um, couples counseling. It can help you work through these kinds of issues. But I wonder, it's like if a man doesn't feel comfortable going to talk to a doctor, you know, who does he feel comfortable going to talk to? How can he be able to work through these issues? I mean, unless the issue is very severe, right? Like, it just depends on what's going on. But for some men, I think some men probably would prefer to kind of see if they can treat it themselves, right? So by making just some simple, quick and easy lifestyle changes to see the result. And for some men, it happens almost instantaneously. So let's say for men who drink a lot, if you know that you drink a lot and then you know there's a presence of erectile dysfunction, then you can try to limit your drinking. Reduce the amount that you drink. Now, if you're chemically dependent upon alcohol, that's a different story. You're going to have to probably do that under you know, supervision. You're going to have to do that in a secure place you know, so that in case something goes wrong, you can be taken care of, you can be cared for. There, there are places that you can go if you have a chemical dependency and that's what they're designed for you know in case there is an adverse reaction because you can't just quit certain substances cold turkey you just can't do it so you have to kind of be tapered off of it especially alcohol if you are chemically dependent on alcohol do not my message is not to say that you can just quit drinking alcohol but i know for some men you know if they drink here and there and they see that, okay, it's causing an impairment in their ability to be able to maintain an erection or get an erection, then perhaps try drinking less and see what that does. It's also, this issue is also um, common among people who are obese. So just changing your diet, exercising more, can those small kind of, those small changes can have a huge impact i think on a person's ability to be able to get an erection cuz it's all health you know it's all health mental health physical health is very much connected a lot of times we like to think of the two as separate you know so we think they have nothing to do with each other but our mental health impacts our physical health and vice versa the ideal situation is that you have great mental health and great physical health. So, you know, it's a challenge, I think, for some men, because if you, you're you used to kind of living life a certain kind of way, right? You, you're, you're lose, you're, oh, sorry guys, it's late. <laughs> but you're used to this lifestyle where, you know, you come home every day and you have a, you have a case of beer, you have, you know, bottle of alcohol, you know, or you're dependent upon some drug. It's like, if you're used to it, it can be very difficult to make those changes. But I'm thinking, you know, what's more important? You know, is getting drunk more important? Getting high more important? Or, you know, is being able to enjoy sexual activity more important? Sometimes you have to kind of make a choice and decide for yourself what's more important. But I think that, you know, women on the, other, on the other side, it's like, it can be very frustrating, I think, for the woman who is involved, who has a partner who has erectile dysfunction. You know, whether it's a girlfriend or a wife, it can be very um, distressing to her too. And she may not know what's the cause. And she may think, I kind of touched upon this earlier, where... Sometimes, you know, men living with erectile dysfunction may inadvertently blame the woman and say, oh, it's your fault. You know, if it wasn't for something that you do or if you do this, then I'll be able to maintain an erection. But sometimes it's not that simple. And so on the flip side, you have women 
who now are feeling distressed and feeling insecure because they are with a man who has this issue of erectile dysfunction. Now, the thing is, because it has to be for six months, right? Has to be persistent for a duration of six, a minimum of six months. So it's not something that is situational where, okay, it just happens, you know, on on a certain night or whatever. But this is something that is persistent. This is something that has been going on for a period of time and is causing some significant distress in the individual. Or the individual is just like, okay, what the freak is going on with me? And I think... Unfortunately for some men, it has to get to the point where it's very distressing. So distressing to the point where it causes conflict in the relationship or even to the point that the couple is no longer together because they're always fighting and wondering like, okay, why are we fighting? Because there's just so much sexual frustration in the air, right? And when it gets to that point, it's just like, okay, sometimes the man realizes that, okay, and he's, he comes to terms with himself and says, you know what, especially if it's, it's not just um, specific to one relationship, right? Because it's one thing for a man to be with a woman and say, well, my dick is not getting hard, right? It's you. And then goes to another woman and something different happens, right? He doesn't have that problem. That's one thing. But if a man is experiencing this issue across the board, across different relationships where it doesn't matter the woman, he is having problems with getting his penis hard and keeping it hard, then we know that that's a problem that is specific to the man himself. There's something going on inside the man himself. And I think, you know, it's unfortunate. I just wanted to read this one criteria. The sexual dysfunction is not better explained by non-sexual mental disorder or as a consequence of severe relationship distress or other significant stresses. I find that very interesting that the DSM will put that in there because the interesting thing is that erectile dysfunction a lot of times comes as a result of relationship stress but it's interesting because that kind of still kind of ties into my last point being that it's not necessarily the relationship that's causing the distress so a man can't say it's your fault you know blaming it on the woman but it's actually something going on inside him that is causing this problem because we know that stress us this stress a certain minimum amount of stress alone is not necessarily gonna impair a man's ability to be able to get an erection i mean men a man can get his dick hard regardless right if it's working right but if it's not working right it's just ain't gonna it ain't happening it's not happening you know, no matter how sexy a woman is, it's just not happening, unfortunately. And I think that in and of itself can be the very, it'd be the most distressing thing. You know, I'm not a man, but I can only imagine like, you know, you have this tool, right? And you kind of expect it to lay it down, to deliver, to perform, to impress this woman, right? So you can, can leave an impression on her, right? And then you're not even able to keep it up or even get a certain level of rigidity in your penis, a certain level of hardness, essentially. They call it rigidity in the DSM, but it's simply enough stiffness and if your dick is not hard enough, if a man's penis doesn't reach full rigidity as it should, you know, there can be some, it can result in other issues too, especially in a, a couple relationship, let's say, where they're planning to have kids. We know that in order to get a woman pregnant, there has to be ejaculation inside her, right? So he has to ejaculate, but only that. It may seem that, it may sound as if it's easy for a woman 
to get pregnant, right? The process of conception is easy, right? Because people get pregnant all the time, right? Kids, apparently, you know, have unplanned pregnancies all the time. But in order for the conception to happen, the sperm has to take this crazy, amazing journey up a woman, a woman's uterus, right? And to the fallopian tubes. That's a long journey. And if a man, his penis is not rigid enough, is not erect enough, we can see some issues with the ejaculation. That sperm is not going to shoot as it should should shoot, right? Into her uterus to reach the point where it needs to, to reach. That sperm is just going to seep out unfortunately, and just die and leak out. Now, we do know, I mean, naturally, it's pretty common when a man ejaculates into a woman, a lot of sperm does, you know, find its way outside of her body. It leaks out, it comes out. But in a healthy man, that sperm has the ability to shoot straight up and get to where it needs to go. So, I mean, erectile dysfunction is just not an issue that impacts the man, but it can impact, you know, the relationship that the man is in and the couple's ability to reproduce. Hi, Shanice Sanders. We're talking about erectile dysfunction. If you guys would like to chime in, feel free to chime in and share your thoughts and opinions. You know, we're all adults here, so... I feel like this no topic is really off limits for me because we're adults. We can talk maturely about it. And I know that this issue is something that impacts a lot, a lot of men, you know. And men, I probably won't hear from no men on this post. <laughs> and that's fine. But if you guys just watch and listen, that's that's great too. Because that's the, really my whole point in making this video. It's not... I mean, I would like to have you guys comment and to, to talk and to share your perspectives. Anyone's perspective on this topic is very beneficial. But, you know, if if you don't want to share and you just want to listen, I think that's that's great, too. Because my whole point in this video is just to inform, to raise awareness on an issue that I know impacts a lot of men. And it's happening to men younger and younger and younger we're not you know tradition like i said when you think about erectile dysfunction we think about okay that's that's dad that's that's granddaddy having that problem that's not that's not your husband that's not you know your your partner your boyfriend but it impacts a lot of men and i think sometimes you know men may laugh it off or men may be like man you know I pre-ejaculated or I came, you know what I mean? Sometimes men come before even inserting and that's an issue too. And I think, I guess because it's, it seems kind of common, right? That for some men, it's just like, okay, no big deal, right? No big deal, whatever. But I think, you know, it can be a problem for a man you know, especially if he still considers himself to be young and he's trying to make something happen and it just ain't happening. It just ain't happening. But like I said, the good thing is that there's treatments for this um, outside of medication. But, you know, if you feel like, you know, that's the best way to go, then for some men, that's, they want it quick and easy, right? And I've seen that the medication can be pretty effective in taking the pill, um, it does allow a man to be able to sustain an erection, sometimes longer <laughs> longer than what a female can stand. Um, but the flip side to it is that any type of drug you introduce into your system, into your body, can have an adverse effect. And it changes your chemistry. It changes the natural physiology of your body. So sometimes you can confuse the body, the mind. The mind, naturally, you know, the mind and body knows what it's supposed to do, right? It has certain functions. It has these things that it's supposed to do. And when foreign substances enter the body, those foreign substances can confuse 
the body, the natural functions of the body, essentially, so that the body has to kind of reconfigure itself and figure out, okay, there is this foreign substance that's being introduced into the system telling it to do this and it's manipulating is manipulating these these natural functions in a way that the body is not used to so the body has to adjust and once the body becomes adjusted to this new substance and the reaction of the new substance the body then becomes dependent upon that substance for it to function in that way. So, just like any other substance that a person partakes, you know, and can become dependent upon, you know, those pills are no different. You know, we see Viagra, that's like the most common, right? But there are other forms, other types of natural pills that men take that are pretty much the same can have the same adverse effect where unfortunately a man may find himself if he takes those pills he may find himself reliant on those pills for the rest of his life because that's just the way the body is so i'm a natural person and I always like to encourage and promote natural remedy treatment methods and remedies to fix in these kinds of issues, mental health problems, um, and even medical problems. This problem, you know, it is it's psychological, um, it's biological, it kind of, it's pretty much borderline, you know. It's borderline medical, it's borderline, you know, psychological, that's why it's in the DSM. But, you know, if you go to your doctor, your uh, physician, they can treat it. If you go to a psychologist, life psychologists are able to treat. Some psychologists kind of stray away from, like, sex, talking about, like, sexual dysfunction, sexual disorders. You know, they, I guess, feel more comfortable talking about the more common, typical disorders like depression bipolar and anxiety PTSD you know like you know sex is like oh it's still even taboo for a lot of professional licensed psychologists unfortunately so finding a well trained licensed psychologist or therapist who you can work with um, who can work with you through this issue it may be a challenge but it's not like it's impossible it's not like it's impossible um i would recommend a sex therapist so in your area you know there's ways that you can look up licensed therapists a lot of times you can just do a google search but i have to you know reiterate that make sure they are licensed because not everybody who claims to be a therapist and sometimes even so-called psychologists are not even licensed. So you have to make sure that they are licensed by the state that they claim to practice in. And you can search in every state, you can go online and search every licensed therapist, psychologist, and you can you can find out who's licensed and who's not licensed. So make sure the person is licensed. Make sure they have a good track record. Um, I mean, in terms of client testimonials, because of issues with you know HIPAA and confidentiality, um, it's considered to be unethical sometimes, in some cases, a lot of cases actually, for clinicians to have client testimonials on their website. But some do so it just depends but that will definitely i guess be helpful i guess if you could find a therapist a licensed clinician who has some client testimony at least at least some kind of references so that you can see that okay this person is effective and they know what they're doing because unfortunately just like you know authors give themselves best-selling author title you have a lot of therapists that kind of give themselves their own acclamations and and uh, accolades and, and credentials, unfortunately, when they're not really competent in that area. 
you know, they, that's not really their level of expertise. So you have to really be careful when you're seeking out um, a licensed therapist to work with. But that's just my spill on this topic. And I hope that I was able to shed some more light on this. I would have taken questions if you guys have any questions, but doesn't seem like it. <laughs> I guess you guys don't want to don't want anybody to know, but it's okay. I mean, whether you have this issue or not, I think it's just good to be informed about it. Um, you know, and especially for women to kind of take that into consideration, you know, if they have a partner, um, or husband, um, understand that stress is not, is not, um, the penis's best friend, so to speak. So, um, as much as you know, sometimes women we can we can be very argumentative and can be very challenging sometimes in relationships, you know, towards men. I think that you know it's help. It's good to kind of keep in mind that too much stress is never a good thing. And especially, especially when it comes to sex. And you guys just know, like, people may say, okay, I'm a freak. I consider myself a freak, but I'm a sex enthusiast, right? Like, I feel like, you know, sex is just part of humanity. It's part of life, right? That's how we all got here, right? From, from sex, right? Our parents had sex. That's how we got here. So sex is a beautiful thing. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I don't consider it taboo. It's not taboo in my book. You know, I can talk about sex any time of the day. It's just as natural as breathing to me. And I feel like with an activity such as sex that God gave to us all to be able to enjoy, you know, it's something that we can cherish and appreciate, you know, and nothing should get in the way of it, you know. Not even erectile dysfunction. So I'm going to end on that note. And I thank you guys for watching. There will be more of this where this came from. But um, today, what's today? Today is Thursday. So it was kind of like a long day for me somewhat. Not a long day, but kind of, kind of stressful in a way. Because I had class and I had a clinical intake that I did. You guys are more than welcome to go check out my page here on YouTube to watch my mock clinical intake that I did. It was a follow-up session um, that I did. I started last week was the first session and then today was a follow-up session that I did with a mock military veteran um, of the U.S. Army. I think it's very interesting and um, I think you guys will enjoy it and I'm, I appreciate your feedback on it as well. So if you guys would like to leave some comments or suggestions, I'm all ears and open to it. But um, like I said, I'm about to end this video. So I thank you guys for watching. Feel free to comment below. Share your thoughts below on the topic and I will catch you guys later. Thank you guys for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>